I've got some slides prepared. So can I share the screen? Yes, beautiful. Okay, so let me bring up the slides and make sure everybody can see it. Can you guys see that? And what about my mouse? Can you see the mouse? Okay, great. All right, so uh, this is the outline of what I'd like to talk about. And uh, I'm gonna start with something that maybe we all already know about, but I think it's very useful to talk about the basics of reverberation. Um, and I'm gonna start by talking about that briefly in inside rooms in a normal kind of airborne environment, because I think having that at least said uh, in this context allows us to carry it over to the underwater environment quite well. And so I'll, I'll then talk a little bit about the underwater environment uh, for sound and then specifically some things about rever uh, reverberation in the underwater environment. So uh, this is a very basic description of reverberation just to get us all on the same page for a kind of a physical understanding of what, what that sensation that we hear, what it really is. And so um, I have a sound source here, an imaginary sound source, and it's an idealized sound source and it emits spherical waves. And the amplitude of those waves is dependent upon uh, one over the distance, the range R between the sound source and then wherever the receiver may be. And in this scenario, we're thinking about a source and a receiver in the same place, so right here. And uh, just to contrast a little bit later, the speed of sound in air is about 340 meters per second. And so we might imagine a scenario where we have two walls, something uh, maybe 15, 20, 30 meters away. These are big, hard walls. They reflect sound very well. So we're going to assume here that they reflect perfectly. The sound hits it and it bounces off <clears throat> without any loss of energy. And so uh, we'll put the source and the receiver right in between. And then we'll let everything remain constant in the environment. And so this may be something you've experienced, um, this kind of echo that you would hear from this situation. And so I'm just gonna do a very simple little animation uh, and show what's happening. So this axis will be uh, sound pressure level or the something related to the perceived loudness. And then this is time along this axis. And so if you say something or clap your hands, you might say, hello, that sound, the part spherically hits the boundary and then it bounces back. And so you hear it again, hello. And so, and what follows the, the color and the amplitude will be related to one another. And so that keeps going and uh, these su successive bounces get lower and lower in amplitude because of spherical spreading in this case. And so we would perceive that as individual echoes. So hello, 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 hello. And so at some point, that same phenomenon merges into what we think of as reverberation in our perception. Um, so in this situation, this slope of this curve depends upon the distance that the sound has to travel and the speed of sound. And then it also depends upon how the amplitude is changing. In that case, it's only due to spherical spreading. And so our perception of what would become reverb in a situation like this is just dependent on those two things, because this is a very simple case. So uh, that slope is constant in this case because everything is spatially homogeneous. So now if we change the system and we take the same receiver and the same everything, but we just put this inside an enclosure, but we also now allow sound to not perfectly reflect, but to enter the wall material and depart the system whereby it loses some energy. So the walls are close together now, travel time is reduced, some energy is lost, and this now might be perceived as reverb. And the basic difference is just each of those successive echoes is closer in time. And in this case, the, the relative amplitude is different than before. And so at some point when that overlap becomes sufficiently close together, our brain perceives this as reverb instead of individual echoes. And so here's just a comparison of those two again. Um, so in both of these cases, this pattern that you see, this slope here versus this uh, line that has a, a changing slope, it's all dependent upon uh, how much time there is between the first sound and then every other echo that comes back and then how much energy is lost between each of the successive echoes. And that those are the two things that govern what the reverb sounds like. 
So in that regard, it's very simple, but the, those two things that we would need to determine are very complicated, especially in the ocean environment. All right, so maybe stop for a second, see if there are any questions or comments before we go forward. All right, so let's now talk about reverberation inside rooms. And so uh, these slides come from my notes from my undergraduate class in engineering acoustics. And it's useful to tell you why uh, the students are there to learn in that class. We, we wanna be able to calculate reverb level in a room and learn what kinds of treatments you can put in the walls to uh, change that reverb level. So that's the purpose of these slides. So it's useful again to, to set the stage for in the, in the underwater case. But so here we consider a rectangular room with uh, flat walls with different lengths, LX, LY, LZ. And uh, this room has resonance frequencies. And so you can calculate these resonance frequencies and they're basically integer multiples of half wavelengths in each of the three dimensions. And so here's the length, the width and the height, uh, and then an index number for each of those to count up uh, integer multiples of half wavelengths. And the reason I wanna show you that is because the number of those modes is dependent upon the room volume, which is this quantity V, and then the frequency uh, of the sound we might be listening to. And then it's also inversely proportional to the speed of sound cubed. And the number of modes is important because when the number of modes is low, we might not perceive reverb. We might perceive something more like individual echoes. Um, but when the frequency gets sufficiently high, the modal density gets very loud, uh, not loud, excuse me, large. And then we might perceive something more like reverb. And so just to illustrate that, this um, axis over here would be something related to amplitude of sound. And then this is a normalized frequency axis divided by the first resonance frequency, which might be down here. And the, the point of this is as you go higher in frequency, um, the modes get closer and closer together. And so the exact distribution of how these lines are related to one another is dependent upon the room geometry. And this just indicates the modal frequencies. But now if we add um, absorption into the room and now imagine creating a sound in the room, playing that sound at some point and listening to it at some other point, we, not, we could plot now the acoustic pressure or something related to what we would perceive as loudness. And once uh, before we had single lines here, now um, we have uh, a continuum and sound is present at all of those frequencies, but it's louder at the resonance frequency and less loud when you're not at a resonance frequency. <clears throat> but as those frequencies get closer together, uh, we approach what's called a diffuse field where there is very little difference in the amplitude as we continue to go up. And so this diffuse field is something you would be searching for if you were building a theater or a classroom or a lecture hall. This modus, modal structure is not visible to us anymore. And uh, it seems like sound is, is the same everywhere. And so that's what we call a diffuse field. And, and that's what we typically think of as the kind of sound field that leads to reverberation. Um, so now just briefly, how would we calculate the reverberation time in a room based on this idea? So here's another little cartoon, imagining a sound source and a receiver. And this kind of just illustrates what's happening as the sound is launched, uh, might get to the receiver before anything else and we'd get a direct path but then the sound bounces around and hits the walls and some of it leaves and some of it continues. And eventually all of these rays that are launched come back to the receiver. And that's what we perceive as reverberation. And so in an engineering acoustics class for undergrads, you might wanna learn how to control that reverberation so you could make it appropriate for different kinds of uh, venues. And the metric we use is to calculate the time that it takes for the sound to come from a steady state uh, amplitude value, turn off the sound source at some time, and then allow that um, level to decrease by 60 decibels. <clears throat> and then the time we take to do that, we call that T60. And in, in room acoustics for a diffuse field and the idealiz idealizations we, we spoke about before, there's actually a very simple formula that relates the two. And uh, it's simply related to the volume of the room in meters cubed, and then the total absorption in the room in a unit called Sabines, which is meters squared. 
And so just simply thinking about that, if the room is larger, that T60 would become longer. So a bigger room we think of as more reverb in that room. And then likewise, uh, if the absorption is lower, we would get reverberation going up. And uh, I'm not gonna play this entire video, but I'll just show you one of my favorite examples of a very large reverber reverberation time is the baptistry in Pisa. And some of you have probably been there and the reverberation time there is measured in seconds and uh, you can sing chords with yourself. So um, let me make sure you can hear that. Let me share that with audio. And so I'll only play a second of that. And it's, there we are. So were you able to hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, so that's an example of very long reverberation time. It's a large room and it has very hard surfaces. So the long reverberation time is what we end up with. Okay, uh, now let me say just a couple more things about airborne acoustics and we'll switch to underwater. Um, so, uh, this expression that we use to calculate reverberation time depends upon the absorption in the room. Uh, and this will ultimately be related to the absorption underwater. And so I just wanna point out that that quantity absorption depends upon a lot of things. So this is um, a table from a textbook and it shows a bunch of different types of surfaces you might find uh, inside a room. Plus it also includes objects in the room. And uh, this quantity A, the absorptivity, for example, you can calculate it for a chair or for a person or for all kinds of things. And I want to point out that it's frequency dependent. So that reverberation time is going to depend on frequency in part because the um, absorption depends upon frequency. And then all these others that are listed here are surface treatments. And so you multiply by the surface area times the lowercase a to get the big uh, the big A. So that gives you some sense of the kinds of things that control reverb in a room and then similar things are going to control reverb in the ocean. So now let me just end this part by showing you some measured reverb time curves from a classic book uh, on architectural acoustics. So uh, these plots are measurements um, that are supposed to look something like the plot we see here, which is the idealized curve, which is a straight line. But in reality, it's not a straight line. It's a wiggly line. So this means as you're listening to the reverb, the amplitude is going up and down a little bit. Um, and so uh, in the case that we show at the top, this is a narrow band sound with only low frequencies. And so there are a few modes. And so you get this uh, fluttery sounding echo or reverberation. And you, you might almost perceive discrete echoes in that. So that's not a diffuse sound field. But now if you excite the room at higher frequencies with a broadband source, so the field is more diffuse, uh, that reverberation now becomes more like the idealized model. And uh, in, the, in architectural acoustics, you might even add um, structures in the room to increase that diffusion to make that more of a, a slope of a constant line. Okay, so that ends the first part of the discussion and I hope that wasn't too, um, too simple for the group here, but I think it's a nice segue into the underwater environment. So let me stop for a minute, see if there are any questions, and then I'll move on. Okay. Uh, I would have a question. Yes. Uh, how would you expand the Sabine formula into the water? So I don't believe that the simple form of that equation exists underwater, I'm sorry to say. Oh. Um, I'm gonna show some modeling uh, techniques that are used in underwater and they're not anywhere near that simple. Okay. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, I meant to point out that we won't find such a simple result underwater. All right, anything else? Uh, I can just add that in reality it's possible to define an equivalent volume in the case of a, a, a very large uh, space with only the floor and the ceiling. In that case, there is a formula 
which I developed 20 years ago, which estimates a volume which can be used in the Sabine formula. But we will come back to this later. Okay. Oh, that's that's great. Thank you. All right. So perhaps I spoke too soon in saying there wasn't any simple formula. Perhaps what I should have said is there's, there's no simple formula that, that works in every case. Um, as we're going to see, there are different kinds of reverberation in the underwater environment. And uh, I'll show the way to calculate that. And, and it's true. It can yield simple equations for very simplified ocean environments. But the, the real ocean is very complicated. So. Um, this is a little sketch illustrating an example of an ocean and up at the top we have breaking waves. And so if you think about the airborne environment, the, the first thing that changes here is that surface is not flat and it's temporally not constant. It's always evolving. And then beyond that, things can happen to where the surface now generates additional complexity, these breaking waves spill over and create bubble clouds, which can then be present at the top layer. And all of those are moving as well. And so you can imagine now in the past, we had a simple ray, a sound wave represented as a ray bouncing off that surface. It's no longer flat and it's now gonna interact with things on its way. Uh, the bottom is also rough and can be very um, different from being flat. And then we have in, within the volume of water, we have a, a lot of different kinds of things that might scatter sound, many of them biological, including fish and other marine life, and then uh, other materials that may be entrained in the water. And then the water itself, the, the kind of the basic properties of, of the water, which might be represented by the speed of sound, but also density and salinity and other things. Uh, those are now um, spatially dependent. So the sound speed can become a property of both the depth and then any of the lateral dimensions. And so it's also changing in time. And so it's not constant either. And so all of these things are illustrated here. And so now if sound bounces off the ocean bottom, instead of the specular reflection that we had from those walls, um, it's bouncing off in pot potentially lots of different directions. And then the amplitude is dependent upon the direction. So just that simple interaction that we saw in a room is now much more complicated. And so that same thing would be true with all, all of these things. Uh, anytime the sound scatters from any of these surfaces that uh, the scattering will become more, much more complicated. <clears throat> um, another thing that changes is how the sound propagates. So we no longer are bounded on all sides. We have openings in our uh, system such that it's a waveguide. And so um, uh, the waveguide propagation is very complicated. And so one of the things that I want to illustrate, the effect of this temperature dependency, instead of the sound propagating in a straight direction, like these arrows indicate here, it can propagate in uh, curved paths. So uh, this plot is just an example of some uh, sound speed distributions as a function of depth. So this is depth on the vertical axis and then the speed of sound on the horizontal axis. And these are some very simplified characteristic uh, sound speed profiles for different areas in the world from the Antarctic Ocean to various other places. And you can see the sound speed changes from 14 something hundred meters per second to almost hundred meters more in some of the more warm regions. Uh, and you generally see a lot of different kinds of profiles in the upper uh, shallow water regions, but in general, as you go deeper and deeper, um, the effect of pressure takes over and it's monotonically decreasing. Um, if you launch a sound wave from somewhere down in the, uh, the axis of what we call the sound channel, where there's a minimum, as the sound waves propagate up, they bend back down. As they propagate down, they bend back up. So this plot here is what's called a ray diagram. And uh, the sound source is illustrated over here. Depth is on the vertical axis. And then range is on the horizontal. And then this is the, the sound speed profile for which these rays were calculated. And so you can see if you launch a ray going to the top, it might interact with the surface, bounce down, bend, and come back and interact again. You can launch a ray that just barely grazes the surface and bounces, uh, doesn't bounce, but just bends. And then all these other rays that are launched at shallower angles are confined within the sound channel and they never interact with the bottom. 
So the notion is that calculating these path lengths, uh, which if you recall from the airborne reverberation case, we needed to calculate the time between reflections. Determining that path length now is very dependent on this environment and can be quite different than a straight line path to the nearest scatterer. So these are curved rather than straight and more difficult to calculate. And then the last thing that I'll mention about this underwater environment, which differs from the airborne environment, is that since this is a waveguide, the sound no longer travels at a constant sound speed. It travels at a sound speed that depends upon frequency, and it also depends upon the distribution of the sound source in the water. And it creates what's called a, a modal structure. And so each of these little curves represents the speed at which sound might travel as a function of frequency. And uh, a, real, a realistic sound would normally require a, a number of modes to propagate. And what that means is the sound's going to going to uh, disperse. It's going to, a pulse will lengthen. And, and many times we might think the pulse is lengthening because of reverberation, but it's actually lengthening because of this dispersion as well. And this is just a simple little illustration of what that might look like. Um, this is a measurement in a shallow water environment that comes from my own research. But um, the point here is that if you make a very sharp sound like this delta function like impulse, um, this is recorded 300 meters away. And um, what you see goes along with the picture that you see here. Um, at higher frequencies, the sound speed is faster. So that arrives more quickly. And then the lower frequencies require longer time to arrive. And so that's that quick uh, clap like sound is dispersed out in time and the frequencies are separated. All right. so. Uh, those are the primary things that are different about the environment, and they also lead to what's different about the reverberation. And so, again, maybe I'll stop for a second and see. I've only got about five to six more slides, and then I'll be finished. So any questions or comments at this point? Yeah, I just wanted to step in there um, and, uh, I, and ask you to clarify. Uh, it's not that the medium itself is dispersive. Um, it's that um, the, uh, uh, what would you say, the, the ray paths or the modal paths followed by uh, different frequencies are, are different. And that's what gives rise to the dispersion, right? That's correct. Yeah. So the sound speed is not causing the dispersion. That, that is possible, for example, in the bubbles. The bubbles themselves can cause dispersion. So the, the wave that propagated right through the little patch of bubbles could change its uh, relative propagation because of that medium being dispersive. But here, um, the waveguide, it's the fact that the waves are confined in this narrow channel and can propagate uh, horizontally that causes the dispersion. And that would be true in an air-filled waveguide as well. It's also true in things like fiber optic cables with light. So that's right, the medium is not dispersive here. It's the waveguide that causes the dispersion. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. OK, are there any uh, other questions? Can I just interrupt two seconds, Preston? Yes. <clears throat> yes. OK, so uh, other than me, I'm sorry, I'm the one that's keeping time. So uh, and I know all of you, there's a lot of things to discuss. And, 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 and it's really, really great this, Preston. But could we uh, focus? And I also like to have uh, other people's opinion um, on these things, that, that these, uh, the key question that we asked if um, we really like you to understand when you go into this uh, reverberation in underwater environments now, if we can try and, uh, let's say, focus on where we could get the longest reverb and also where we could get the widest frequency range. Because uh, seeing that our, um, let's say, goal is to find a very varied uh, library sample or create this of these underwater reverbs, we really like to understand which kind of environments uh, um, these, could, could, uh, these could be, which would make sense. So if you could... Uh, focus a bit on that and then we would like to hear from from some of the other participants as well if they have other let's say uh, inputs for this this question yeah that's right so the the next few slides will address that and then i'll be done with the slides and and we can talk about it so um i wanted to show initially uh an example of measured reverberation in a deep water environment and to kind of show how different it is from reverberation in a room 
So this is the same kind of plot. There's the received amplitude on the vertical uh, scale and then time. And so uh, you can see here eight seconds. That's a very long reverberation time. But uh, we have these different uh, elements of the, that, that uh, time record that are coming from very different things. So we get some surface reverberation from the ocean surface. Uh, and then we get some volume reverberation from material inside the water column. And then there's some material down near the bottom, which is causing some scattering. And then now we get what you might think of as a discrete echo from the bottom. It comes back and then we kind of start over again. You know, so this would probably be perceived as a series of echoes and each echo would have its own different kind of sounding reverberation. Uh, as that sound continued to propagate down that waveguide. And so very different from what we might expect in a room, in part because the, the, the environment is so much larger. Um, and it's also potentially filled with these volume scatterers, which we, we normally don't think of. We don't really have many volume scatterers inside a room in the air in the room. I um, also wanted to show a, a movie, which is a simulation. Uh, to kind of give you a sense of if you simplify this a little bit. Um, this is real a real measurement with the real world and all of its complexities. And this is a simulation where uh, the waveguide is flat, except where it's got some roughness. So there's no large bathymetry changes, but the bottom and the surface, is uh, it's got roughness. And so this is a Gaussian window, 250 hertz pulse, and I'll just play it. And there's no sound, but you can see it. And uh, there goes the sound. And if you concentrate on the, the receiver, you'll see this, this is the reverb here. As the sound propagates down that um, channel, uh, you get essentially paths that are bouncing back and forth. We call those photometer returns. But then all this roughness scatters a little sound back towards the receiver as well. And I might play that again just really quickly. And so, I'll show you then the reverb uh, time curve for that in just a second. So you can also see the striations in this pattern. So these are fluctuations in the amplitude um, that we would hear. So let me stop that and show what the, the reverb time curve is for that. So now this one maybe looks a little bit more like the one we saw in air, but these fathometer returns bring back these uh, repetitive what might sound a little bit more like an echo, but because of the roughness, um, we see some additional filling in of those gaps. Uh, in a smooth surface, we would maybe hear a little bit more of a discrete echo for each of these, but with roughness, those nulls are filled in a little bit and then the peaks are not quite as tall. So that red curve is with the rough and the blue curve is with the smooth. And that, you know, you would, you would perceive that sounding a little different, a little less fluttery. Um, and then at the end, we're, we're getting mostly things coming back from, from roughness, propagating back from down the waveguide. So it might give you some sense of, of how you might alter uh, a model or uh, a real world environment to change the, the reverb. Um, uh, another thing I'll say, um, this is sand in this environment, which allows the sound to penetrate. And you can see the sound penetrating here. And then another way we could change the reverb is if we had a very hard bottom made of rock, then um, the sound waves bouncing back up would be of much higher amplitude. So you see here, these are light colored. If this was a harder, a non-penetrable bottom, this would be much, much louder. And so uh, that, that curve would be tilted up. There would be less, ampli uh, less loss. So that reverberation time would be longer. All right, so let me just finish up by saying a few things about how we might model all of this. And uh, I'll go through this quickly. Um, we have to imagine, the, the fundamental thing we have to imagine is each of these little interactions scatter sound. We have to understand every time that happens, we have to predict how much scattering occurs. And that could either occur in the volume or on a surface. And so these little uh, illustrations, which comes from a textbook on underwater sound, seeks to illustrate how you might do that. Um, imagine a sound wave coming in. It's coming from the left to the right, and it's far enough away from the source that the wave looks plain. 
it looks like a flat wavefront, but it interacts with some little element of the scatterer. And we think of this as a, a, a little a little elemental volume that scatters sound. And then the dash lines illustrate the sound scattering from that. And so we basically have to understand uh, if certain level of sound is incident in intensity, how much is scattered. And that might be dependent upon this angle as well as um, the frequency. And then this is the same illustration for the surface. So volume scattering and surface scattering, we, we might imagine how much sound scatters from a little area patch on the bottom. And again, the same thing, the fundamental thing we have to calculate is this surface scattering intensity. How much energy is scattered given a certain amount of incident energy. So you can imagine that's difficult in the real world because all of these surfaces and all of these volume scatterers are, are different. So once we understand that fundamental scattering uh, uh, differential scattering element from each of those types of uh, scattering functions, we now have to try to predict the reverb. And so this is just a little cartoon that shows how you do that. And so again, we have some source in the ocean. It might have some beam pattern, excuse me. So it would launch a sound wave that would uh, interact with that scattering element. And ultimately it would then come back from that scattering element and then Re uh, arrive back at our receiver. And again, it might see a different beam pattern. And at the end of the day, we can calculate how much sound comes from that one little scattering element if we properly calculate all these things. And then we have to integrate over the entire environment to then get one of those curves. And as we expand our integration in space out into longer and longer spatial extent, we get a longer and longer time curve. And so the last thing I'll show are some calculations and then some comparisons to models. So uh, this is an example of one of those calculations and it shows three different kinds, the, the surface that we talked about, the volume reverberation and the bottom, each calculated separately and then you can add them all up. And so again, you can see a kind of typical curve but with fluctuations. Um, and then you can see the relative contributions uh, of those different uh, three components. And then the last thing I'm showing is a model that's mostly just surface scattering. This is uh, uh, just primarily scattering from uh, the ocean bottom. And here we can see uh, not only a model, but also predictions. And these are nine different pings in um, closely spaced, but not exactly in the same place. Um, and so this, this shows kind of the temporal and spatial variability you might see in the real ocean. Uh, there's this little feature here um, which moves around or is not present uh, in, in all of the pings. And in this case, we see two different kinds of scattering models. One of them, the red one, is uh, a more uh, deterministic scattering uh, volume where they actually measured that scattering uh, differential element and used it in the model. And then the, the green one is a model where they just predicted the scattering from the statistics of the roughness. But in general, both of those are, are much better at predicting uh, the scattering. I don't, I'm not showing any measurement in comparison to models in these more complicated cases, but they, they exist as well. All right, so I'll, I'll finish up. Uh, there's a summary of the topics. Here's a bibliography of the, some of the stuff I showed. And so I'll, I'll end at this point and we can discuss. Thank you very much, Preston. That was really useful to get some of these concepts, uh, let's say, uh, <laughs> very clear. And at least for us, it was very, very useful. So thank you very much.